everyone. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it is being recorded. <laughs> and can everyone, I just want to remind everyone to mute themselves during this uh, first part of the presentation, and then um, later you can go ahead and ask questions. So um, as Kat said, uh, couch coffee culture is part of um, a new type of engagement with our audiences that we're exploring through a series called Pilot Projects. And really for a while now, it's been our goal to pull back the curtain on the daily lives of the artists and curators who we work with to show where they live, where they work, what they're watching and eating and listening to, and what happens behind the scenes. So today we're in for a treat because we are talking with Andres Payana Estrada. Hi, Andres. Thank you for joining us. How are you? Hey, hey everyone. I'm doing good. Thank you. Just chilling on my couch. <laughs> so you're coming to us live today from your home in LA. And like a lot of us, you've been for the most part working from home since the start of the pandemic. And you're, you've promised to show us around today. So um, I'm not going to read your whole bio. Kat will put a link to Andres's website in the chat here for everyone to look at later. But I will briefly say that Andres is an artist and a curator. He was raised between Juarez and El Paso, and he currently works at the Craft Contemporary in LA, where he is the curator of public engagement. And he also teaches at CalArts. And earlier this year, which is, it now already feels like a lifetime ago, uh, he curated a show for us called Total Collapse, Clay in the Contemporary Past which deals with, and I'm going to use your Instagram description here, clay, technology, histories, and impending doom. So a little <laughs> impending right. doom for your Sunday morning. <laughs> um, so we will have time to talk about the show a little bit later, but um, I think that if I had to sum up the essence of Andres's work to someone who doesn't know you, I would say that you are someone who is deeply invested in our relationship with objects and the meanings and the memories that we assign to them. Is that fair? <laughs> Absolutely, correct. Um, the, meaning of the, of the meaning of objects, how we assign value to them, how we assign memory to these things and, and kind of the power that that, that has as well. So um, first we wanna start with a quick icebreaker and you've really teased us with your photos of your morning drinks and your space. <laughs> and I just imagine you living in like neon purple lighting at all times. So I hope that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I'm gonna stop pink lighting right now. <laughs> so tell us what are you drinking today? So right now I am drinking uh, a green juice and I'm drinking it from my morning wood mug uh, made by Ben Medansky, who's one of my really good friends and a great artist that uh, works here in Los Angeles. Um, so kind of to start off the day, a little bit of green juice, morning mug, morning wood mug to kind of get, get the juices and the energy flowing before I get caffeinated too hard. <laughs> That's great. So you, you do you drink three drinks every morning? You know, I, I usually have about three different things, three, four. Uh, kind of like laying around that whenever I'm in a meeting or whenever I'm kind of like getting the, the day going I usually have a green juice I usually have my coffee which is um, I think I mentioned it in the, in the Instagram which is usually a uh, cafe espresso uh, Cuban style cafe espresso um, and I usually don't take it with anything I just take it completely without sugar without cream without anything and then the other thing that I usually drink uh, once in a while is kombucha um, which is also, I feel like, a, a nice way to, fresh way to start the day without kind of like hitting yourself over the head with something too harsh immediately. So are you one of those people who has like half empty glasses around your home at all times of liquids? <laughs> <laughs> there's usually a half empty glass of water by my nightstand. That's always there. But there's, you can definitely, there's definitely stuff around the house. And today there's, there's definitely stuff around the house because since we're going to be walking around, I figured I should just have drinks all over the house. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> well, I'll share that today. I'm actually drinking out of this mug that I got from the thrift store for 37 cents. <laughs> the oh, ceramic mug. All oh, those colors are so nice. Mm -hmm. And um, I spoiled myself a little bit today and got takeout from 
a place in Phoenix called La Bohemia. So not only am I drinking their Cafe de Olla, um, which yes. has um, coffee, espresso, oat milk, cinnamon, I think cloves and orange rind, which is creamy and delicious. But I also have um, a drink with tamarindo in it with Ooh. espresso and topo chico. Oh my God. And so I'm, I just went all out for you today, Andres, because I also got a, a concha. Because ah! <laughs> I had to go with the pink theme today. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm about to have a sugar crash after this. I hope you know. <laughs> That's amazing. I know you told me about La Bohemia. I, I, I can't, can't, can't wait to go visit whenever I'm in Phoenix. Sounds really, really cool. And that drink sounds delicious with the tamarindo. So, um, when you first gave us the walkthrough of Total Collapse, you prompted us with this question that made us think about ceramics in a different way. And I know you wanted to talk about this today to start us off. Yeah, it's usually, I, I kind of like it as an icebreaker question and a, and a way that puts kind of things into, into context. And I, I would ask you, and I would actually ask the audience too, and you can respond in the chat, uh, what ceramic objects have you interacted with today? Uh, since you woke up and since you got here to your Zoom. And actually, which ones have you interacted with? Uh, other than my coffee cup today, I think mm -hmm. that um, I would list the uh, tiles in my shower, uh, the, the very 90s tiles in my kitchen. I have to say it was redone in the 90s and it has this like red and green geometric pattern that oh. we like don't even want to get rid of because it's so funky. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. um, and then the third one, I would say, um, we have Saltillo tile. I live in a 1949, um, sort of really small bungalow style house. And we have the original 19, uh, 1949 Saltillo tiles throughout the floor. So, you know, as soon as I wake up in the morning, my feet hit the ceramic tile. Well, so it's like yeah, a really tactile totally. thing that I'm always on the tile. Totally, totally, totally. And there's that kind of like initial interaction of like your body with the ceramic and like the coolness of it and stuff right, like that. Right, exactly. So, um, but yeah, you know, one of the, one of the reasons why I like to why I like to ask that question because there's kind of like this immediate kind of like understanding of what ceramic objects exist in our lives. Like there's the cups, there's the mugs, there's the plates, there's the tile, and then if you start thinking a little bit more hard, there is your sinks, your toilets, and if you start thinking even a little bit more uh, away from kind of like that immediate kind of immediate thing that you see and that you exchange make it an exchange with there's kind of like a lot of times there's pipes uh, that you that are kind of like drainage pipes or stuff like that that are made out of clay um, and then there's also when it was one of the things that I was really interested in kind of bringing out from total collapse is that your electronics um, that an electronics and kind of thinking a little bit more expansively like how much have we developed or really like how big of a relationship we develop with clay and with ceramics that they've kind of it, it's one of those materials that has evolved with us and has kind of like intricately woven itself into our entire kind of like social object material uh, reality. Um, one of the things that I like that I like to talk about too is uh, in connection to kind of like this idea of your technology that has all these like conductors and a lot all these kind of like smaller components that make these things possible. That's everywhere. That's in your cell phone. That's in your iPad. That's in your laptop. That's probably in your iPhone watch if you wake up in the morning with that. Um, and then there's and then there's some, right? Like there's also kind of ceramics and uh, tiles that line space shuttles um, or they're used in like health and a lot of a lot a lot of different applications. Buildings usually might have some sort of ceramic component. Adobe could be part of that family as well. Yeah, I think um, one of my favorite things about this exhibition that you've curated is that you really tie the past with the present and the future and the ancient with the futuristic. And I feel like um, this is also just so much about how you work between the digital and the physical. And, you know, I first met Andres almost two years ago when we invited him out to speak on a panel on the future of craft. And my first impression was that, first of all, of course, you have impeccable style and you should be sponsored by Koss if you aren't already. Maybe you already are, I don't know. <laughs> um, I keep putting it out there. <laughs> yeah, I know. Someone just tweeted them right now. <laughs> but um, I just remember we had a very long day and 
of you know intense discussions about the future of the field and um, we had set up this very traditional PowerPoint format and when it was Andres's turn to present he started by diving straight into Instagram and he pulled up the hashtag ceramics and showed that there are something like nine million photos um, tagged ceramics getting refreshed every second and that just really made all of my millennial brain synapses tingle <laughs> as someone <laughs> who fully exists in this digital world for better or worse. Um, mm -hmm. But it just showed how you're so interested in this conflation of our digital and physical worlds. And that's something that you really brought into the exhibition as well. well it's also something that's very true to something that we, we have to consider and think about currently. Uh, during COVID, um, and especially because a lot of our lives are now like this, like a lot of our lives are being sort of mediated by a digital realm. Um, so there's there's all there's there's all these kind of like connections and disconnects of how you communicate with people now. I mean, to some extent, Instagram and all these social media applications laid the foundation to us being able to communicate a bit more cohesively and a little better right now during COVID because um, if you imagine if we haven't kind of like developed all these different ways of how to interact with each other through a screen uh, we would kind of like have been lost in the woods um, so it's always been interesting kind of like thinking about that and I think a, a lot about that too um, in relation to absolutely being a millennial um, and how our relationship or these younger generations relationship to technology is it's more nuanced in the way that it's kind of just built into your reality and to who you are and how you communicate. Um, but then I, I, one of the things that I always think about too, especially with, with kind of like these technologies is like the sense of tactility. Like there's a sense of tactility that happens when I'm holding this mug um, and there's an exchange and a communication of like, my hand is now holding this mug. Um, and then there's also this different kind of like tactility that now we are, Kind of very used to and it's very seamless in our lives and it's how we how we communicate with tact has been redefined by our realities and our relationships to touch screens because now kind of your your fingerprints and the tapping and the text messaging are ways of like connecting to multiple multiple different things which i've always kind of like bewildered by The fact that all of this digital, all these digital images have a place where they exist in a physical place that's hosting mm -hmm. all of the images, <laughs> which right. you talk about in the show, and that kind of blew my mind because I didn't even think about that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's always like this, like digital is always seems to be this imaginary, like sublime thing that just exists around us. And it does. I mean, there's, there's, I don't know, there's Wi-Fi waves that, that and all these kind of like different sort of like radio communications and stuff like that that can affect physical things could affect kind of like migration patterns or insects or stuff like that but then there's actually like the tangible things like the fact that all the stuff that you have up up on instagram lives in an actual material server somewhere around the world mm -hmm. so um i want to read some of these answers in the chat just really quickly of what ceramics objects people have interacted with today someone said an ashtray a Yellowstone National Park mug, mm. another mug, a planter, concrete floors, Petershire mug, a Francoma drinking glass, and a Talavera planter, cooking pan. That's a good one. Yes, 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 yes. One of my favorite <laughs> items in the kitchen is my porcelain knife. <laughs> Can I jump in quickly, Brittany and Andres? Could you give us some context for those of us who haven't had the opportunity to see the show? Well, we want to get into a couple things before we get to the show. We're going to end on the show just to give people um, more context, but we're going to take you through Andres' home first. Okay, cool. So what, um, what we decided to do today was, you know, you, Andres, explore how an object beca can become a trigger or a vessel for memory and meaning. Mm -hmm. And so as we talked about this conversation, we decided it made sense for us to have it as a show and tell with meaningful objects around you. Um, so you were raised between Juarez, Mexico, where you were born, and El Paso, mm -hmm. Texas. Mm -hmm. So how does where you're from inform your work? And do you have an object that sort of represents that? I do, I do have an object. And I have a little setup right over here. Okay. <laughs> that I'm very excited about.
Okay, so that's my first object, which was my Ben Medansky mug that I've been drinking from today, this morning. I love the but, display. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, but kind of thinking about being from the border, um, being from El Paso and having grown between these two places, um, the object that I wanted to show is a rock. Um, and it's actually a rock, it's um, andesite specifically, uh, which is one of the uh, one of the different kinds of rocks that you can find uh, from the Rocky Mountains. So it's that mountainous re region that um, connects both cities. And one of the other things that I wanted to add to this, because I like, I like to think about kind of like how objects relate to each other and how together they can tell a story. Um, it's a piece of meteorite from uh, Campo de Fuego. So a lot of the, a lot of the th reasons why, why I brought this rock is kind of thinking about geography and thinking about place and thinking about where someone is from. And unfortunately, we have a lot of arbitrary uh, lines that have been created for us to tell you where you're from and where you're not from, where you can be and you cannot be. Um, so I always like to think about the geographical and I like to think about the natural, uh, which uh, also makes me uh, think a lot of, of the project that y'all did currently with, uh, with Tania Candiani. Uh, whereas these these patterns of migrations and how how the natural can exist in both places, um, so that's that's why I wanted to share this kind of Rocky Mountain um, rock. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. And um, Kat is going to also uh, type another question to you all in the chat. If you could choose one object to represent where you're from, what would it be? So we'll see what those answers are soon. So um, also, Andres, you have a background as an installation artist. Mm -hmm. How is this informing how you reimagine your living and working space during quarantine? Well, I, let me think. I mean, I think a lot about I mean, kind of, kind of tying it back to my practice, I think a lot about place and tying it back to the rock that we just saw um, about how a place creates an environment. And this is a very like arts and crafts um, kind of like foundational way of thinking of how the environment that you surround yourself with and the objects and the things and the places and the people and the energy and the memories and stuff and all these different things kind of create the environment that you're living and thriving in. Uh, so I, I it, it, during COVID, I've actually been playing around with my living space. Um, so I've been kind of like painting walls and installing some artwork that I've had kind of uh, locked up for a while. Um, and one of the things that I've been doing is, and I think I was, I was mentioning this to you, I have been doing a lot of research and a lot of, a lot of research, um, both kind of uh, literary and also visually uh, into modernism and specifically Mexican, um, the influences and kind of the overlaps of modernism, the influences modernism was taking from Mexico, uh, and then how mo Mexican modernism kind of took place in Mexico with these conflations of like both the historic and the contemporary. Uh, so I, I've been kind of playing around a little bit with that in my space um, and, and kind of like grabbing from the installation kind of practice that I have, like the pink lighting um, and creating kind of these, these spaces that almost transform or can take you somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So can you take us on a tour? We're dying to see your home. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Here. So, let's see. So I'm going to be taking you through, you're going to see the magic. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be taking you through uh, two spaces in my house. Uh, one of them is my living room, which is the one that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, um, this, this, that's my living room. That's where I was sitting right now. Um, I have a small collection of books over here, of some research and exhibitions and things that I'm looking at. I have some ceramics, this trophy that I made. Um, this thing, uh, this little figurine right here by Deborah uh, Katz and a little Tony Marsh. This find that I had from eBay. Uh, we have Barry Zipperstein over here, and I have a small collection of uh, NASA paraphernalia that I've oh, been wow. collecting from specifically from the Apollo missions. 
Uh, so you see like Neil Armstrong right here, but it's all with like a little play. Um, this is supposed to be Neil Armstrong's hair. Um, so I have that going on. I, I tend to collect a lot of things mm -hmm. um, and they it eventually makes its way into my practice um, or might make its way into a project. Uh, but this is my favorite room right now. Uh, which is uh, the dining room. It's my favorite room, of course, because I'm here and I eat here. Um, and I mean, one of the thing, one of the things that I, the, the object, the next kind of show and tell of the objects right here would be my plants, uh, which I can't put in the little rotating thing. Uh, but they're kind of one of the things that I that I've been playing around a lot with and trying to um, kind of bring some some natural into the living space. Which what is, is the plant? What is the plant on the table? That's beautiful. This plant, it's a, it's a mix. It's actually a little floral arrangement that I did last, that I made last night. Um, so it's uh, it's just a a, a palm leaf, um, a Mexican uh, palm frond from a palm leaf, a smaller one, um, and then just a mix of um, I believe these are zinnias and some yellow roses, and then this is more of a tropical plant um, that I that I clipped from my front yard. You might have an alternate career in flower arrangement. I think I do. You know, I, I really, really like, I really like flower arranging. Um, it's kind of like one of those like therapeutic hobby things. One, I mean, I once in a while make the flowers for like events at the museum and stuff like that, which is kind of fun. Yeah, I know that um, during quarantine, I think that people have been cultivating their green thumbs as much as possible. And it's interesting to see a lot of people posting about their plants at home too. Totally. I mean, I, I think during, definitely during quarantine, I've obtained a few more plants. Um, it's kind of like you're bored and you want more children or I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I've, I've gotten a few more, which has, has been nice. And I, it, it's really interesting, like how much they can change the space, mm -hmm. uh, both like visually, but then also they cool down and they make air a little bit. Uh, cleaner and yeah. So a few of the objects people have put in here that are meaningful to them um, or represent where they're from, what would it be? Uh, Nora says breakfast taco, uh, machicado and egg, avocado, oh, yes. furry dolls. Uh, Luis Ocean says rock pendant oh, necklace from Rio Bravo. Um, Devin says maybe a rosary, but like the cheap plastic ones you hand out to kids at mass or at family gatherings. Mm. Um, a hammock. These are coming in through the chat, so I'll keep looking. Um, so then what I want to ask you is what are you watching? What are you listening to? Do you have any new hobbies? What are you into right now? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, um, so with COVID, definitely been watching a, a lot of things and I'm sort of like running out of things to watch. Um, I was going a lot through uh, the Almodova kind of like full library. So mm -hmm. I was revisiting anything from like anything, um, everything about my mother to the skin I live in to kind of some of the Julieta Volver, which is amazing. Um, but one of the things that I, that I sent over that I've really been thinking about and been, been watching a little bit more closely and a little bit more critically have been uh, three shows in particular that I've been re-watching. Well, two shows and then one of them is a, is a documentary. Uh, one of them is Pose by uh, FX. Um, and if anybody is not familiar with Pose, it's, uh, they're in their second season and it's a show by Ryan Murphy uh, that is um, sort of a fictional drama that is, is pulling from, from actual histories and actual individuals from the uh, drag, well, not the drag, from the ball scene in New York City. Um, so that's um, kind of like a, a cultural happening that started developing in, in New York. Um, I believe it was um, close to the, in the 70s, late 70s, it had some earlier beginnings, but then it kind of blew up during the 80s. Uh, unfortunately, um, there was, it, it did, it did suffer a lot during the AIDS epidemic, but it's, it's basically a space for, uh, uh, mostly um, people of color and um, that belong to the LGBTQ community. And I was really, I've been really interested in that, in, in that show in particular because of the representation of, of trans, trans actresses of color um, and with a, with a really large representation of, of black trans actresses and 
Latinx uh, actresses as well, um, to the point where the first opening scene, I, I believe, I believe they have, it, it opens the scene with five characters, all of which are trans women of color. Um, and it was kind of like this like mind blowing thing that happened in TV during the first during the first season. So I've been I've been thinking a lot about how stories are being told, uh, who's telling these stories, and how they're how they're being told, um, and how kind of the representation of of a community and the visibility of the community is kind of a, it, it's a really really powerful thing. And if y'all are interested, you should definitely watch Disclosure. Um, which is another one of the things that I that I recently watched. It's on Netflix, um, and that one it just goes through the entire history of trans representation in film and in TV, from like the darkest, really nasty stuff that happened earlier on that that positioned trans um, trans and overall queer individuals as a joke, um, as that being kind of the first kind of uh, introduction to to trans individuals on the screen, and then where it is today. Uh, which I think is it, it's it's really really powerful. And the other one was uh, My House, uh, which um, which is uh, was a show that was created by uh, Vice TV, um, which is also documenting the ball scene, but the contemporary ball scene because it's still going. Uh, so it's pretty incredible seeing all these things and seeing the stories of these individuals that have not been told and being able to see them on screen because seeing someone on screen and seeing, and seeing the representation of someone either on screen or in exhibition or in leadership positions in different museums, like having a relationship to these individuals, either, either individuals of color or women or individuals that belong to the LGBTQ plus community, like having those people have a representation is a really powerful thing because that, that is kind of ways that we're working Towards dismantling some of these prejudices um, or some of these uh, some of these racist, homophobic, transphobic uh, tendencies that what we might have have grown up with, and maybe we grew up with them because we never had the experience of working with these people um, or seeing uh, or seeing the the real true stories of who they are. So those are things that I've been that I've been kind of like watching uh, very consciously and thinking about. How, how I'm connected to those histories, how I'm through, through uh, by being a, a queer man uh, from Mexico. Um, so how I'm connected to those histories, to those legacies, uh, but also thinking about myself and what position uh, do I have in this, in this history and, and continuing to build platforms for my community um, and for, for, for the artists that I work with and for, for these communities within kind of like the things that I'm able to do, like curate them into an exhibition um, or, or bring them into programming at the museum or focus on them during my lectures um, in my different sort of like classes that I've been teaching. So it's, it's all these little things that together they kind of like build a larger narrative for individuals. So I think it's really important. Yeah, and I know that you have an object you want to show us right now, but I, I <laughs> when we talk yeah, about, like, total, yeah. when, we have to when we talk about total collapse in a minute, um, that kind of weaves into, you know, talking about canons and the dominant craft discourse, craft and ceramic discourse, and who has been excluded from that history. Um, so do you want to show us the object that you've been working on while you've been at home? Yes, I do. Here, give me a minute. So these are, these, these are some of the things that I've been uh, working on. And I've been working on this project for um, a little bit over a year. And it's an extension of another project that I have. Um, so it's this, which is a blanket. Um, so this, this blanket, and I'll give you uh, y'all a closer look in a minute. Uh, so this blanket is a, a woven, a digitally woven blanket um, that was woven based on an image that I sent to these individuals that I've been working with of the dance floor of a gay club after the dance, after the club had closed down um, and everybody was gone. So it's kind of like that idea of the trace of individuals having lived or experienced something in a space uh, and thinking very, very specifically about, uh, in this case, um, the LGBTQ community and, and the impact that having a space um, has. But then also, this is, this is to me kind of like a story um, in the sense that 
um, and I'll show you the Hong ones over here, which are two different ones. Uh, this one is a dance for, from Asheville. The one that was on the rotating stand is from El Paso, Texas, and this one's from Juarez. Um, and you could see a little bit of the detail in what these look like woven. Um, so I was I was interested in like the trace, the trace of a space, the trace of dancing, but then also thinking a little bit about like high and low, uh, which kind of loops it back to these these conversations of of what histories are told and 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 by who. Um, and I was thinking about these ideas of like high and low because it's these objects are being presented like weavings uh, that I'm kind of like looking a lot into like French tapestries uh, and jacquard weavings, but then they're elevated through the making and the materiality, but at the same time, it's kind of like a play on the elevation of the unelevated. Um, so an elevation of the dance floor, of the trash, of the debris, of the trace of the community. And now they're kind of like, hung on a wall, kind of looking like some sort of abstraction. I think that would make an incredible exhibition, actually. Um, and I wonder if um, other artists are working on things similar to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to ask you about your jewelry. <laughs> Can you tell <laughs> us about your necklace that you're wearing and any other jewelry that you have nearby <laughs> because you have an incredible collection? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, what am I wearing today? You know, I, I, I completely forgot the name of this artist. I bought this in, uh, one of the things, one of the dangerous things about working at a craft institution um, is that you, there's a, there's a shop and, and you get a discount and you end up buying a bunch of stuff. Uh, so this is one of the pieces that I have um, in here. Let me, so this is one of the pieces that I have, which is the spring. Uh -huh. um and it's it's really really great it has like a, a hand a hand dyed cotton uh cord that runs through inside of the spring um and the other thing that i have that i'm wearing right now is this pin um which i actually made um and this kind of connects back to the the, the rock that i showed you all earlier uh, because one of the other things that i've been doing is i make i've been making molds of those Mm -hmm. um, and then casting them in porcelain. This is actually my coffee in here. Uh, so this is a cup and then I've been making some of these. So it's kind of like a way of like carrying where you're from with you constantly. That's amazing. Uh, Mickey wants to know if we can see your entire jewelry collection. That might be a while. <laughs> it might be a while. <laughs> yeah. It's downstairs too. <laughs> So I want to allow time for questions, but um, first I want to talk a little bit about Total Collapse. Um, can you tell us about how, a little bit about the exhibition, how it came together? Um, I know it was Absolutely. organized jointly with the Rubin Center in El Paso, and it was shown there before um, it, was showed, it was shown here earlier this year. Um, and I know you have an object that you want to talk about related to the exhibition. I do, yeah. Well. Yeah, and actually, you know, um, unfortunately right now I'm on my iPad um, and I'm having uh, trouble showing images, but maybe if you have access to that, um, I'll yeah. show the object first uh, okay. and then maybe we can, to kind of like contextualize and then maybe if, if we can show some images that would be Sure. Uh, but the object that I have for this, it's part of a, a series of kind of uh, object poems that I've been working on. And I did this one, uh, for, it was the American Craft Council conference that happened and the Mita Wiggers invited me to be part of a, a, a telling stories through objects. And I, I created a cairn. Um, so if any of you are familiar with cairns, it's those rock foundations that kind of guide you to a location or tell you where you are. Um, and I, for, for this show and tell, it's a lot more simplified. It's, I'm only including two objects. And one of them is a broken cell phone uh, that no longer works screen is completely cracked. Um, and the other one that I'm going to be uh, connecting with this is this shard um, that's a, a broken piece of pottery that I uh, purchased, uh, incidentally, I actually purchased this on eBay. Um, and there was, there was little to no information about it other than it had come from, uh, from Mexico. Um, and it, they thought it was dated at least, um, I think it was 
how long was it? I think it was like 500 years or something like that. I don't remember the specifics, but I was interested in, in pairing these two items together because to me, these two items, this small item uh, poem kind of speaks to uh, a lot to total collapse. And it's these, these conflations of, of technology and contemporary life with history uh, and with deep history that relates to a specific community and to, to a specific experience. But both of them are equalized now in a space that they are both broken uh, and they no longer serve their original function. Um, and so those are, that's kind of like my little object story uh, to kind of contextualize this. Um, and so Total Collapse, um, it's deep, deeply influenced by these two ideas, by technology, the demise of technology, the rise of technology, um, and what that means um, for the future. Um, but then also thinking about our history and our past um, and our relation to how we've evolved, um, how we have created things and, and how, how, we, how we have evolved our relationship to, to materials and to objects and to technology and to systems of production, capitalism, all these, uh, um, all these both beautiful and troublesome uh, sort of aspects of our, of our human experience. Um, and a large part um, of, about total collapse, and I think it's great to see uh, Gala Paraskim right here, um, had to do with, with, with how these histories are, are being told, um, specifically with Gala Paraskim, uh, she's been working with a, a collection of, of ceramics from the Proctor collection in LACMA. Um, and it was, it, it's a ceramics collection that now resides in the United States under the name of a, of a white collector uh, that has passed away. But now all these objects are now kind of just like lumped into the name of this individual. Um, and in, in some, some person might not think about it, but that, that's a very peculiar thing to do. Names carry strength. Andres Payan Estrada carries a strength. Um, and the name of this, uh, this, this white collector carries a strength because it, it's, it's almost, it's, it's this action that's erasing the history of who actually these objects belong to uh, and where they came from. So there's, there's a bit of that in the exhibition. Um, there's also Daniel Baer uh, working with a lot of uh, post-consumer ceramics. Uh, there's uh, Armando Cortez uh, with this incredible performance that was done on site of unearthing these two beautiful golden objects that were uh, encased in pillars of mud and dirt and broken ceramics. The more than it there. So it was it was these two these two realities. And it, was, it was actually really interesting thinking a lot about total collapse um, as as COVID started um, make, kind of controlling our lives and, 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 and controlling the way that, that we navigate our spaces because it was, it was, it was these, these connections to our relation with technology um, and having to interact with technology um, as a means of staying connected to our communities, which is a, an interesting kind of like push and pull. Uh, but then also thinking about the darkness behind mass production and, consume, and consumption and wanting the new iPhone all the time um, or needing the new iPhone all the time because the old ones kind of gate out. Um, so it was, it was a lot of these things that came into, into Total Collapse that, I, that I, I think somehow got recontextualized in my mind. So I know we could talk about Total Collapse for a long time, but we're running out of time and I want to leave some um, space for people to ask questions. Um, but I do want to let you know that Kat is going to post the Total Collapse Gallery Guide the, um, that goes with the exhibition that looks like this for you to download for free in English or Spanish. And it has the um, curatorial essay and information about all the artists and it folds out into a poster. So mm -hmm. um, feel free to check out uh, more about Total Collapse there. So before I open it up for questions, I have one more question for you. Mm -hmm. You told us that you used to race dirt bikes. <laughs> Can you tell us more about that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, growing up, um, 
I, I, like I mentioned, I grew up between El Paso and Juarez, and um, my dad had an affinity for motorcycles. So growing up, I was, I was always running around, like literally rolling around in mud. Um, so it was, it was an interesting, it was, it's an interesting thing that I, that I still try to unpack because it's this like really performative sport and, and you're, you're foily and you're dazzly and stuff like that. And, but then at the same time, it's hyper-masculine, um, mm -hmm. or, or hyper-masculine. Um, so there's kind of like these like pushes and pulls between these two, these two things. I mean, and one of the things that I enjoy the most is ro rolling around the mud. So I always kind of think about my relationship to play and how maybe, even though my, my, I never continued racing dirt bikes, I, although my father really wanted me to, I feel like somehow there's still, it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So um, anyone who has questions for Andres, Andres, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been amazing to sort of peek into your world. I love seeing your plants and all of your objects and, um, Maybe Kat, can you also put a link to Andres's Instagram account on the chat here? So anyone who has questions for Andres, feel free to um, type them in the chat or you can unmute yourself at this point and ask questions with your face. <laughs> <laughs> Faces are good. Uh, Nikki wants to know who are some artists that you've been following? on Instagram or in person? Mm. Oh, yikes. Some artists that I've been following. Um, let's see. I mean, I, I always follow all the peers that I, that I work with with exhibitions. And I, so those are, those are always on my, on my Instagram. So anywhere from like Armando Cortez or uh, Nicole Seisler. Um, there's, there's also, there's, you know, I, maybe I can, I can, I could send you all because um, I can't think out of the top of my head what these handles are, but there have been a lot of Instagram accounts. Uh, there have been, and now there's 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 more that have been coming up uh, that are specifically focused on artists of color um, and black ceramicists, uh, which I think is it's it's a really powerful thing to 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 have to acknowledge, um, and that you that these that now is when when people kind of like started creating these, but it's also really important because it's the voice uh, to these individuals. So. There's, there's been a few of those that I've been following. Um, I've also, what else have I been following? Um, some drag queens. Um, yeah. Everyone will just have but, to follow Andres's Instagram yeah. to see what he, who he's following. <laughs> Sherry Farag I've been following. Mm -hmm. um, an another question is, how did you feel eating a clay cake? And yeah. <laughs> Wait, did someone actually ask that? <laughs> in response to one of your pieces. <laughs> oh my God. I can't believe people still see that. Well, I guess it's up on my website. Um, so it, was, it wasn't too bad. Um, it, was, it wasn't too bad. It was actually dirt that I had cleaned and sifted through uh, from, um, from my childhood home in Juarez. Uh, so it's kind of like this connecting connect I did that for a ceramics class actually for a clay class so it's connecting it to earth and dirt and this connection to nationality and when you're from and and I by that time I was living in the United States so it's kind of like this gesture of almost wanting to eat the mm -hmm. materiality of my childhood at home wow uh Don is asking what are you most excited to do post pandemic good question mm see my family mm -hmm. um, and actually some of my family's here and I, I just saw some comments from my nephews and my mother um, so I think seeing my family being able to, being able to travel back safely to El Paso maybe um, uh, I don't know if my mom wants me there more than a week but stay with her <laughs> two weeks or three weeks <laughs> uh, yeah um, her food. <laughs> we have a comment from Diego who says me and grandma are going to eat enchiladas today how do you <gasps> feel <laughs> <laughs> Rude. <laughs> I love those enchiladas. Uh, what interests you the most about space? Is this connected to your past living in Texas? You know, I'm connected. I'm, my interest in space lie with this like idea, kind of like thinking back about thinking back to migration uh, and this kind of like imaginary of a space where things are open, things are different. Uh, space with possibilities. So I've been, I think a lot about that 
Um, and then recently, a lot of the work that I've been doing, and, and you could probably see it a little bit from those, um, from those blankets, I've been thinking a lot about queerness in relation to space as well. Um, and one of, the, one of the projects that I did about a year ago uh, was called Blue Apollo. And it was, it was almost this like queering of the Apollo mission narrative uh, and merging that with uh, the narrative of uh, going to a gay bar for the first time in Juarez. So kind of like stepping in the moon and paralleling that to stepping in the dance floor at a gay bar for the first time. That's, ama that's an amazing parallel. Yeah. Uh, someone is asking, Julio is asking, what is your favorite Juan Gabriel song? <gasps> Yo no nací para amar. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't Where going to love. It's 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 so incredible. It's so heartbreaking. Um, it's it's during a time where Juan Gabriel uh, was was wasn't uh, op open openly gay, and it's it when if, when you think about that and you listen to the song, it's so heartbreaking because he's talking about how he wasn't born to love, and how he's seen everybody else around him loving and getting married and having children, and he doesn't have that. Um, and when you think about it now, he didn't have that because he wasn't allowed to have it by the society that, that, that was manipulating and controlling his life, unfortunately. Uh, we have another question. What, would you, what advice would you give to young upcoming ceramic artists? Ooh, um, what advice would I, would I give to young and upcoming ceramic artists? Um, do your work, break the rules, build communities. Um, remember that a lot of times the things that you're being taught and the histories that you're being taught and, and these like narratives that you're being taught are not always the only ones. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of work on your own because the structures and the, and, and the education systems that you're in might not be able to give you what you need. Um, so push yourselves to kind of do, do, do some of that on your own as well. And, and you'll find some beautiful spaces to, to relate to ceramics and to clay differently and to materials in general. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we have another question. Did you watch yeah. Mucho Mucho Amor, the um, Netflix special? Yes! <laughs> what did you think? <laughs> <laughs> this is my Walter Mercado setup actually. Um, it was beautiful. It was it was so heartbreaking and it was it was it was beautiful. I cried a couple of times. Um, I mean I I remember I think my mother's watching this, but I remember like watching Univision and, and uh, always waiting for the horoscopos and um and he was he was such an incredible figure and he was one of those other it was similar to Juan Gabriel, one of those other one of those other figures within sort of the canon of, of, of representation, but almost a distorted, like filter representation of, of, of queerness in, 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 uh, in Latinx um, media, but, uh, but such, such a powerful, such a powerful image. Definitely recommend it. Maybe you can curate a Netflix playlist for us next. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Well, if there are no more questions, um, I just want to thank you again, Andres, for spending the morning with us and also for curating the show. It was an amazing exhibition and we've loved working with you and we really appreciate this, this look into your life in this strange, strange time that we're all in. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, and you know, I'm gonna um, end by reading the last paragraph. Before you paragraph. end, I'm gonna interject. Yeah. Devin had a question that we didn't get oh, yeah. to. Oh, sure, Devin. Yes, Devin. Oh, cool. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Can y'all hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for, for me to type right now. Um, but I have a question about like gaze and kind of consciousness around that in relation to mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. I, as you make a bunch of identity based work um, or work informed by identity, I was wondering at what point in your artistic practice did you start to kind of recognize that that was such an integral part of your practice um, as someone who's doing something similarly in my own work uh, here in Austin. I think I came to that like maybe two years ago and I was like, oh, this work is always going to be seen as like queer Latin work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I made that real, I made the realization that I was kind of working with, with identity-based stuff pretty earlier on. And I think a lot of that has to do because 
uh, that was a, a comfort zone for me to be able to, it was kind of like the, the, the place that I knew and understood from where I was from. Uh, so like the Talavera and like stuff like that, like these were, these were kind of like very immediate things that I, that I, that I understood and, and, and I saw as relating to kind of like who I was as a person. Um, but you know, it's, it's hard, it's hard. And I think, I think it's a, it's, it's something that I can, it's a question that I continue to work through and I, I, I continue to try to like figure it out. Um, because what is, what is the gaze, um, when you're a person of color, when you're, when, when you're from the LGBTQ or, or queer, um, and it's, it's a difficult one because oftentimes you, you can get tokenized, you can get, um, you, you can sort of like start being put into boxes based on the work that you're doing. Um, so I don't know, it's, it's a difficult one. I mean, I've been, I've been looking at, at the work. Um, I mean, one of the, one of the artists whose work I look a lot at is uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres, um, and actually, uh, so Felix Gonzalez Torres um, is a Cuban artist, um, and I have some of his prints right here that I've been framing. And I, I look a lot at, at, at his work because there, there was there was these very very thought out kind of like ways that he was he was speaking about um, about being gay, but then also about migration with like with birds. Um, uh, or or candy stacks. There's a it's a beautiful piece by by Felix, um, which is a portrait of of Ross, which is his lover, um, post uh, uh, being diagnosed with AIDS. And it's it's a pile of candies. If any of you are not familiar, it's a pile of candies that rest in the corner of a museum. And it's the the weight of the candy is the same weight as his partner. And throughout the the exhibition or throughout the the, the work being shown, people are invited to take candy. But if you're taking candy the piece is losing weight. So it's kind of this like beautiful metaphor um, that that weaves like a queer narrative um, and, and something larger than. So I think I, I, it's a question that I still think about definitely. And I, and I, I think it more um, as to who's my audience, who is this made for? Um, and I've kind of like reconciled that this this audience is made for my community and for my peers and for my family. And the work that I do is it's made for them. Um, and and I and but there and, and it'll resonate with other individuals and other individuals will build on it. Uh, but to me, it was kind of like defining who I was making this for uh, and why that kind of really helped me out understand um, what I was doing. Yeah, I think those are a lot of the same questions I'm coming to myself. It's like, it's it's kind of interesting. It's like, oh, the concepts they come like so naturally because the work is so authentic, and one might imagine that then the work would be easy to make. But actually, I get really lost in how it's going to be received and how clear we have to make these concepts because they're going to be really, really challenging for a lot of um, folks who are outside of that identity or maybe in kind of like an opposing way as an institution uh, to really digest and mm -hmm. actually have some meaning. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate this, these words today. So, you know, the, the other thing that I've also been playing around a lot with is the idea of passing. Um, so how can you introduce an idea without the person kind of knowing that you've done it? Um, like, so how yeah. can you introduce queerness without them knowing that they're now thinking about queerness? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a lot about illusion and trying to use these either optical illusions that in my work or uh, some other type of masquerade to introduce the concept, but the viewer doesn't even understand that's what I'm doing, but that's kind of the point. So that's fun because it makes it seem like it's an original idea in their head, which means they're much more likely to accept it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, totally. Awesome. Thank you so much. Also, um, as you might be familiar, uh, Commonwealth and Council is doing a really interesting summer school uh, teach in kind of series. So I would recommend that uh, really cool things like a mutant salon for queer PSE. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Great stuff. Yeah. Young, anyway. young Kutsoft soft is incredible. Yeah, yes, thank you. thank you. Thank you for your question, Devin. Okay, if there are no further questions, thank you so much, Andres. Thank y'all, and I'll just read this last little portion of the catalog.
all. We live in a specter of time in our conflation of digital and physical worlds that expand our relation to everything past and present and give us a glimpse into the future. The digital has given us the tools to connect, to build communities across different geographies and to share knowledge. We have the power to question our histories, to write and rewrite forgotten and erased narratives and to challenge systems and patterns of consumption and value. We are currently presented with both terrifying and wonder, wondrous realities of our existence and have the opportunity to either disconnect from a crumbling world or challenge our contemporary conditions to build our communities towards a new future. Thank you. And that's all, Wilk.